to introduce uh, True Lindy Hop and jazz dance historian and friend of mine, Mr. Leonard Westerlin. Thank you, Mandy, for the introduction. I wouldn't call myself much of an historian. I would say I have a historical interest. Nevertheless, we are about to continue a little bit around Miss Norma Miller. From the beginning, we had a plan to talk about the New York scene in the 80s, but things changed, so now we have a different subject. And I will invite a few people on stage here, but we're going to start to take a look at a movie just to hear a little bit from uh, the story from Norma's own perspective. So we're going to move back about 20 years in time. And some of you were around at the time maybe watching Ken Burns' documentary on jazz. And one little piece was uh, with Norma Miller. So we're going to start to look at that one and then I will invite a few people to come on stage. So Mandy, if we are ready, let's take a look at this Ken Burns documentary jazz from 1999. Popular with dancers, but its maple and mahogany floor had to be replaced every three years. Just 50 cents on weeknights, 75 cents on Sundays. The Savoy was called the home of happy feet and offered depression ravished Harlem a respite from its troubles. The windows was wide open, and so the music can come out, blast right into our living room. Every night we heard this marvelous music. And in those days in the summer, the fire escape was where you sat to be cool. There was no air conditioning, no way. So by sitting on a fire escape, and our fire escape faced the back windows of the Savoy Boardroom. And you ever see shadows when people dance past the windows? You can see figures dancing to that music. And my sister and I would respond to what we saw in the windows of the Savoy, and we would get into the living room and dance to some of the best bands in the world. For years, no one listened to the music and dreamed of going inside. In the spring of 1931, she got her chance. Precisely, it was Easter Sunday, 12 years old. And you know, in those days, you always have a little a new outfit to go out to church. Four o'clock, there's a matinee going to be at this little ballroom. And after church, I dashed up to Lenny's Avenue. And the people that went to the Savoy were shocked. And we used to just stand outside to watch them, and that's what I was doing. We started dancing outside the support ball and I heard somebody say to me, hey kid, and I turned around and he was, he said, you, you, because, and then I turned around and I recognized immediately who it was, it was the great twist mom George in a white hat, white suit, white, everything, asking me to come to the ball to dance with him, and he said, would you come and dance, I said, would I, <laughs> grab me, we dash up the stairs, and I don't know whether I hit each step, because he had such long legs. And I remember just flying up those stairs with him. And you go through these doors. And I think it was the most beautiful place I've ever seen in my life. The reds and the greens and the blues. And that was the first time I ever saw a band on a bandstand. I mean, I've been seeing the shadows. And he, I'm so excited, he took me over there in the corner and sat me down and brought me a coat and said, you sit here and I'll come and get you. And finally, it was his turn for Tussamount George to come and he came and got me and he said, let's go. When they hit that music, all I know is I did everything, he just, he just threw me out and my feet never touched the ground. and he took me right around to the front, right outside, and put me back outside. <laughs> Greatest moment in my life, and I'm excited, excited, I'm gonna go and 
tell my mother and my sister. And then I said, no, I better not say nothing. Oh, so that was something from Nor Miss Norma Miller. I would like to introduce two guests on stage, Miss Margaret Batyshuk. <laughs> and Mr. Chris Lee. <laughs> so we have to move when we show film clip, we have to move the chairs to the side. I I just had the idea to come up on stage to have some light. That's the reason why we are sitting here, so we have to move a little bit. Chris, I'm going to start with you. Okay. First question is easy. What is your experience of Miss Norma Miller? What kind of person was she to you? Uh, first and foremost, I uh, just want to thank everyone for being here and celebrating the life of Norma Miller. Uh, I know it's hard for a lot of us. Uh, unexpectedly, we expected her to be here. Uh, celebrating with us. Um, um, she was such a beacon of light to all of us. Uh, she wasn't a biological relative of mine, but um, in a lot of ways I, she, she felt like, she, she reminded me of my grandmother because she felt like everybody's grandmother. She was so giving, uh, not just with the art form of jazz dance or Lindy Hop, but uh, just life. I think um, one of the panelists or one of the uh, speakers today at the funeral said, if, if you don't have a horse, ride a cow. And she gave this advice to me uh, in my own career. She was this beacon of light and said, hey, you know what? You should try acting. You know, I'm like, I did that with Sanford and Sons. And like, it's incredible to, to see and learn about someone uh, that you admire through watching videos like Hells of Popping. And you see the dancing, but you were like, wow, this person was a complete entertainer. She was Miss Show Business. She, she was an actor, a comedian, and like she galvanized the room and brought people together. And like, it's evident here when we have people from Sweden, Belgium, Russia, China. Like, I am so thankful for our elders. You know, not only Miss Norma, Frankie, you know, even the people that, like Thompson Wilder, and like the people that we don't even know about, because they didn't have the opportunity to travel or what have you, or they weren't around. And people like um, Al Mins, you know, we, we had heard that panel. I just, I don't want to get carried away, but Norma meant to me it was a lot. And you know, she was a family member, like, uh, you know, she felt, you felt very personal with her, and this is it was extraordinary. Um, I was just thankful to know her. Um, yeah, that's a little bit. Chris, how did you experience her, Norma, as a dancer? How would you describe her as a dancer? Well, she always referred to jazz dance, and she really you know, said, don't stop with just the Lindy Hop, you know, look at the Nicholas Brothers, look at Bill Robinson, you know, do your homework and, and, and really study the, the great dancers. Uh, look at the vaudeville dancers like Tip Tap and Toe, the Berry Brothers, uh, the different acts, but also know the, the culture that's behind it because uh, in a lot of ways she reminded me of like a gung fu master. Like, she had this aura about her where, you know, you you have a lesson, and sometimes it's not about a step. She would look at you a certain way, and then that would be a lesson. Or like she would say, listen to the music. It wasn't about steps for her. It was a lot like, okay, let the music fall into your body, and then you're truly swinging. So uh, she wasn't a person that gave steps, but her lessons were more. Uh, from the heart. So, if you're talking about Norma as a dance teacher, uh, can you clarify that question? Would you would you say as a dance individual or as a teacher? Oh, you can you can very well describe both if you like to. That's fine with me. I mean, she was a phenomenal Lindy Hopper. It's evident when you see uh, like Day at the Races and and uh, Hell's and Hopping. I mean, like. We watch those clips over and over again and, and, and 
try to recreate that feeling and uh, you know uh, I mean just watching like um, my own personal journey like um, when I discovered Lindy Hop uh, in Sacramento uh, I really did again I was one of these dancers that really didn't know what I was doing and it wasn't until I met someone like Norma or Frankie and they said they kind of pointed me in that direction and said okay you know these are the rhythm hotshots, and these these are dancers from Whitey's. So they actually gave me a context to really research and understand the lineage and the heritage of the dance. It's almost like if you're taking martial arts, let's say I studied Wing Chun Kung Fu. I know this is getting a little bit off the topic here, but it's just like you know, okay, that's the Grand Master, and that's this master, and then the senior students and and it's a lot like that with the Lindy Hop. You know, it's one of the other panelists it was such a beautiful panel, I'd like to thank the elders that uh, delivered the panel earlier. It, this takes a whole lifetime to master. And they were really dedicated. I remember some of the stories that she told me in, in, in like the hotel rooms uh, when she did like a gig or a lecture. And she said, Yeah, we were at the Savoy Every day, eight hours, nine hours, we live there. So, I mean, that's dedication right there. Margaret, you met uh, Miss Norma Miller 40 years ago, something like that. How come that you came across and met her? And... Oh, well, first I'd like to say, um, someone said in the service today in the church that um, if the final minister or the lady said that uh, we should kind of think of what Norma gave to us and learn from that and um, I feel like my mother passed away just we had her funeral last Saturday and, and now Norma and uh, I think I'm channeling Norma in this one but I'd like to just say something Norma was strong and she said what she thought and I'm a little concerned about the image that came across in the last panel as if the white people closed down smalls. That was not the case. I mean, it could have been the case in an indirect way, possibly, but I went up to smalls with George Lloyd, who I had already won the Harvest Moon Bowl with, just the two of us. And then I went up later, I was at Sandra Cameron's studio because um, George and I had got, a, as a prize for a contest, won lessons at Sandra's. So I was already teaching, but I thought, okay, well, I'll take the lessons. And um, I went to her studio, and they offered me unlimited, and they asked me to assist Al's classes. So I was assisting Al Min's classes at the studio, and so I was dancing with Al, uh, you know, helping the students learn what he was doing. And uh, a group of Al students would go up to Smalls as well. So. I didn't notice a huge amount of white people up there, but maybe there were. And we went up there every Monday. And I was not aware that we were getting all the cabs. It was dangerous to go to Harlem on the subway for, you know, I, I went up once and someone said, oh, didn't you want to get off here on 59th Street? And I said, no, <laughs> because I was like the only white person going up further than, you know, a certain street. And so, I think Smalls did provide cabs for people. I used to drive my mother's car and give a few friends a ride, but um, they did provide cabs, and I was not aware that they were not available to the African-American uh, clientele, which is really a shame, and uh, you know, I was not aware of it. Um, the, but the other thing is, we, we kept going until Smalls closed, and then, uh, after Smalls closed, Al Cobbs moved to Northern Lights. And we kept going to Northern Lights after that, even after we started the Swing Dance Society. So I guess there were some people who didn't go back, but my friends and I would go to both places. So um, I'm very surprised to hear that story, but you know, yeah, it must have some truth to it. But I didn't want people to get some wrong impression. Did you see Norma at Smalls Paradise at the time? I don't remember seeing Norma. I, uh, Al would go with us, you know, and um, Ernie Smith and Judy Pritchett and um, 
you know, in fact, George and I tied Darlene and her partner in, in um, one of the Associated Black Charities events at Smalls. That was a fun, a fun night. I mean, Smalls was a place that you know people went to. I don't, um, I don't remember seeing Norma there, but so the way I got to Norma was through. Uh, I was, a, I was a, an understudy in her group, in her jazz dancers. So Darlene was in the group, Armania, Clyde, Chaz, and um, Stoney, and uh, Debbie, right, Debbie. And uh, so, and then myself and, and Mary um, Anderson was, all, was also there. So um, it was through that those, that um, being a part of that group of just um, going to the rehearsals, then I met Frankie Manning, because Frankie came in one day and he just stood at the door watching and he, you know, just, he's very, you know, just modestly standing there, didn't say anything. And Norma goes, you know who that is? That's Frankie Manning, that's the Frankie Manning, you know. And she was always promoting Frankie, she loved Frankie. And, you know, it's like, this is before anybody knew, well, she was right, we didn't know who he was, and um, so that's how I met Frankie at, at Norma's, and maybe it was like 84 or something, and then um, I went on to dance with Frankie. Frankie and I did the opening of Midsummer Night Swing in the, um, when they started their thing after the Swing Dance Society, it was like maybe four or five years later, I, I danced with Frankie and performed with him, and um, the other gifts, Norma gave me so many gifts, just like by her uh, introducing people and, and how freely she gave out. She was like an encyclopedia and knew everybody and she just remembered names. And So she met Charlie Mead in, in London. Charlie Mead, another one of my dad's partners who's here tonight. Charlie, um, we, I went to Norma's a show at the Village Gate, and there was a, a dance contest there, and Norma was trying to get people to enter the contest, and she goes, Margaret, this is Charlie. Charlie's a great dancer, and, and she goes, Charlie, this is Margaret. You should dance with her. She's a great dancer. And so we danced together in the contest, and we won. And from then on, we've been dance partners, and uh, Charlie, can you stand up? Charlie's here. There he is, Charlie. So, um, we always Think of Norma, you know, we love Norma for so many reasons. When I wrote my thesis, I wrote my master's thesis on the Lindy, and it was published at NYU, at NYU in 1988, I think it was, 87 or 88. And so uh, Norma lent me her book, the manuscript that Darlene wrote, worked on to read as part of my, the research for my book. And she's made so many contributions to my life in different ways. And then with my partner George Lloyd that I won Harvest Moonball with, he was a Savoy dancer. And he uh, and I were going to go down to the South to a, a dance event. I, you know, I said, oh, let's go down. We met somebody at City Limits where we met who was like a shag dancer and they were having this event down there. And uh, and, and George says, well, George is African-American, and he said, well, you better just check it out and make sure it's okay for me to go. And me being from New York, and I, you know, I, I said, well, you know, why wouldn't you be able to go? You know, why, why would you not be able to go? And um, so finally, I, I did call the people, and they said, maybe it's better that you don't go. And I was like really shocked, and when we were relating this to Norma, Norma says, Margaret, how could you not know that? How could you, you know, like, how could you be so stupid kind of thing? You know, she's kind of always yelling at me about this or that, or how could you not know, how can you be a dancer and not know the shim sham yet, you know, and stuff like that. She's just very, like, she cared so much about things and wanted everybody to know about the things that she knew about, and, and she knew that it could be a problem, and it would have been a problem, so we didn't go. But, you know, Norma was kind of there every step of the way in my early years with, with her energy, with her, with her gifts that were not even, she didn't even know she was giving me a gift. It was just a gift by her sharing her, her passion and so passionately and speaking up. 
Margaret, you mentioned normally jazz dancers around 84, 85. Uh, about a year ago, Chris, Mr. Chris Lee, got into the archive of Larry and Sandra. And we have a little clip that we would like to show with Norma Miller Jazz Dancers. This is in the beginning of June 1984. It is at a place called the Red Parrot. And the some of you parrot. might some of you might be in this video. And I met you there, Leonard. I met three Swedes there at the Red Parrot that night. downtown and this was a few years after that and she showed us the big apple and Charlie remember we went to this club and performed it with a group of people there but not the big apple of the, the um, keep punching one it was uh, a simple big apple call and response but she also uh, taught my students and would give this count and instead of counting like a back step, triple step, walk, walk, triple step, or something with like counting, or one, two, three, or four. She says, one, two, one, two, three. One, two, one, two, three. And that, like, I use that in my teachings today to try to give people a different, it's not, it doesn't make sense, you know, with the, the numbers, but it gives you the feeling. And, you know, that's the way it was. She, it would be with the feeling of it and with, with just following and, and, and seeing what she was doing more than um, technically counting the steps the way you would in, in some other kind of 
you know, ballet or, or jazz class. Chris, coming back to you, thinking about this uh, Larry and Sandra's collection that you stepped into a little bit more than a year ago, how much material with, with Norma did you find in their archive? There's a substantial amount of uh, information and, and video. Some of it's really interesting. If you, if you look at it, uh, it's not all dancing. Uh, Larry seemed to be quite the archivist of the dance and really tried to push uh, Lindy Hop for local news stories because at the time I think he was working for uh, NBC. NBC as a producer. Thank you. And um, yeah, and he actually just really tried to push it on for local news and it would be picked up uh, on a national level like for a Regis film and morning show. And there's actually a clip of Norma Miller and the Norma Miller dancers. I don't know if we have that clip today, but they're on the, the morning show with Regis and I think it's uh, Clyde and Amarie, but uh, on a global scale, we got to realize this was before YouTube and Instagram and Facebook and social media, even cable television. We only had probably four or five network channels. So for a local story about Lindy Hop to be picked up on a national morning show that's syndicated throughout America and that was really valuable. I don't know how much of an impact that had, but I, I think it had a huge impact. And that was one of my favorite clips in Larry's archive, amongst others. You mentioned one clip, and I think we have that one available, actually. When Norma is in a morning show... With Regis? I think so, yes. He's, he's the guy that, you know, how, how to be a millionaire. Who wants to be a oh, millionaire? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we it's have... It's a very young Regis, though. He, he looks young. I trust that Mandy is ready to show that clip, so we move to the side again, and this is, I don't know the exact year, do you know which year this is? 85, probably something. Something like this. Okay, it's coming, obviously, but it takes a little time. And this is also from Larry and Sandra's archive. So it's a lot of stuff that have been found there and that have kind of completed the history in the 80s but also with other things, but especially if, uh, the early revival years in the early 80s from 81 up until 85, 86. There's not a lot of break dancing on the show, and of course that's the rage these days. You go out on the street and there's some kids spinning like a top on his head. But how many can really do that? Not too many. In any event, our next uh, young uh, lady has uh, been around for quite a while, and she's been uh, doing uh, a little bit of everything in show business. And today we're going to talk about dancing and Lindy Hopping, and it's nice to have Norman Miller with us today. Hey, congratulations. Hey. And, and thank you so much for joining us today. I so believe Lindy Hopping is not dead, huh? No, it, this is, we call this real jazz dancing. Mm -hmm. What we've done, we have recreated the dancing to fit the music of that period. Of course, it was Lindy Hop who started out. Today is choreographed Lindy Hop. Yeah. And we still have the basic uh, type of dancing, but what we have done, we have combined jazz dancing and Lindy Hop, and that's what the Norman Miller Jazz Dancers are featuring now. Oh, and we nice. do Count Basie's music, Artie Shaw, Jimmy Lunsford, mm -hmm. it's just the greatest well, music in the world. Great 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 this was choreographed, this is the ultimate thing. Yeah, yeah, of Hop, course, yeah. Yeah. this is now when it has become now an art form. Yeah. Well, let's take a look now. Right. This is, uh, this well, is well, right. Anna Mai Payne, and they were once Harvest Moon Award winners, and now they're now members of the Norman Miller Jazz Dancers, and they will give you a typical example of real jazz Lindy Hop, and we feature, we do this a tribute, when we do this on stage, this is our tribute to Count Basie. Oh, terrific. All right, fine. Here we go. Uh, Now it's choreographed jazz dancing. 
stitches like uh, very relevant with the times she would always say hey Chris she would call me up on the phone have you read Trevor Noah's newest book and I'm like no I haven't <laughs> or like Fergie pissed herself she's on the black eyed peas and she peed herself on stage what do you think of that and I'm like I didn't know she did that normally <laughs> Did you see Hamilton the Musical? That's, that's amazing, you gotta go see it. Oh yeah, I saw that one, Norma. But she was very relevant with the times too. It was just so much fun to be with. You know, it's funny because remember I was just saying about her counts. She did it almost the same with the same feeling, but she did one, two, which makes more sense. So she did one, two, one, two. It's a two-step, you know, it's the old two-step. Interesting, I noticed that. <laughs> really good. I was thinking about this film material and I know we have limited time. I know that there is one more clip that I really would like to show. Um, it's one of those, especially if you are a dancer and if you're interested in the in history of the dance, it's an interesting piece because first of all, Norma rarely taught really, unless it was in a kind of professional situation. But the next clip we're going to look at fairly soon. She is a dance teacher together with Frankie Manning, and we rarely saw that happen, even though I remember that it could happen. Do you have any memories of Norma as a teacher for more unexperienced people? 
She didn't have the patience for that. <laughs> but that's what she told us from the very beginning, that she wasn't patient enough. So you had no memories that she had those kind of classes. She cared deeply, you know, she, she was just, she did teach, and she'd just come out with it and say it, and you know, people would be horrified, you know, be singled out. But it was because she was so passionate about it, she wanted you to get it, she wanted the information out. So, you know, when she taught, it could be hard to be in class to be a student, but if you just take it that it's her passion and that's what she wanted to get across and, you know, don't take it personally, that's what I found. She could be very direct in those classes that she was teaching. I have a memory of a class somewhere, and it was a handful of teachers behind Norma, and she was showing something. And there was one teacher, and this is a person that is quite recognized in the scene, I'm not going to mention the name. However, this person was pointed out by Norma with this phrase, you don't even have rhythm in the middle of all the other teachers, which was a little bit rough and tough to get as a comment in the middle of this group of people. However, now we're going to take a look at Norma when she's talking and teaching together with Frankie Manning, and it seems like it is a group of some kind of professional dancers, but definitely not Lindy Hoppers. We won't see them dance, but she's demonstrating and talking about the Lindy Hop. Because the body gets a certain rigidity regardless of what you do. So I find by dancing all the time, it keeps my body flexible. And the Lindy Hop is the best dance in the world. I don't have to do aerobics. I don't have to do anything. I soak, use a lot of tiger balm. <laughs> and basically, that does it. You know, and that's, you know, considering the last half of the night. Be patient. It comes into um, focus. I, I think Larry Schultz is filming right now. Simple that, you know. But dancing it is strenuous at the time. You know, because I lived an entire dancing life for over 50 years. So what's left is a stiff body. <laughs> A lot of things I don't do, I don't even tell. So, oh, groovy. <laughs> you notice when Frankie dances, I always stress, a Frank, Dan Frank Manning's dancing is the best example you can have in rhythm dancing. And the, the swing he does, I have named it the Frank Manning swing. Now, the, oh, I, why I name it the Frank Manning Swing? Because if a man can get that aggressiveness in movement, it can be gentle. And if you notice when he was younger, of course, it was very strong because you had to lift a girl and lift her in the beat. But still he has maintained that type of rhythm that even a person like me, I don't have to think about a dance step. I just leave myself completely to him. And I can trust in the fact that what he's going to do is going to be right. And that's the importance. I can talk to you like this because you are a professional group and you sort of know what I'm talking about. Swing dancing is very deep. We were at one time the bottom of the, of the list because we were considered dancers without any structure. We were dancers out of the street. But we became a professional dance group through days, hours and hours and hours of dancing. We used to dance from 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 6 o'clock in the evening. That's what we would rehearse every day. That was our schedule. Go home, change clothes, come back from 9 o'clock and dance for the rest of the night. We did this seven days a week. We did it when we was on the road. We had the most disciplinarian individual who was over us. A lot of people said that he was this, he was that. But what he was, he was one of the greatest trainers that that training I got from that man has sustained me to dance till today. And I say only he, it was because of him that we have been able to sustain this dance. So that's what I have to say about the dance. Now you can make Well, uh, after this is enough, I don't think I have anything to say. <laughs> <laughs> because it does not say it at all. But uh, uh, like Norma said, I mean, we came up dancing like seven days. She said seven days, probably eight days. And uh, I say eight days because uh, we would practice in the afternoon after we come from school. We would go home, change clothes, come back to Savoy at night, stay at 12 o'clock midnight, 
and then go 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 back home. The next day the same thing. Every every single day we would do the same thing. And when we would come to Savoy at night, and we were ready to dance. I mean, although we had been dancing all day, if we come to Savoy at night, we're still ready to dance. But what we were trying to do that night when we come to Savoy is what we were trying to learn during the day. Now, uh, I would just like to uh, just. Uh, like Ernie had told you about, you know, like that was a uh, performance that we do on the street, you know, like do all the aerials and all that kind of stuff like that. Uh, Norm and I just want to do just a little something, and and then all of us just want to do something. Uh, just a little floor boy, right, as we call it. He's got a New York Swing Band so, Society uh, T-shirt on. So what is it after '85? Because that thing down basically epitomized swing. I mean, uh, if you want to swing, this is the basic. Right, because if you can't swing the basic, you just, just have, you don't have an ear. You know, because in dancing, we hear the music. Now, a lot of people talk about counting. Now, counting is important in choreography. But if you count when you're dancing, you have lost, by the time you counted, you haven't heard the beat. So we stress, you listen to the sound. Watch out. Right. Now it doesn't matter where he is. We know just when he's going to come back in. Right. I'm not even looking at him. <laughs> right. May I have this dance? Wow. Oh, come on. Come on. Visiting me, we were we were 
we discovered some videos that had been locked in the vault for about 80 years. And she was pinpointing every year as we were going through these videos, and she would point out everybody. She had an impeccable memory. She goes, that's Sandra Gibson. Look at her twist. That's Thompson Wilder. That's 1940. And she would point out every couple. And uh, her and Frankie, they just had impeccable memories. They were brilliant storytellers. When they began a story, they would, you know, they would have you in the cup of their of your hand, or the palm of your hand, and, and you felt like you were transformed into the 1930s and 40s. And I think um, I think about that when I and we're lucky to have some of those interviews on film because it's preserved for future generations to pass down that art form. But looking at this clip, of, I mean, it excites me. I'm like, okay, what else can we find? Uh, Margaret, what inspired you the most from Norma's dancing at the time when you were taking lessons, classes from her? It, they, she used jazz steps. She used uh, the fall off the log it, it, as part of routines, just, um, you know, a variety of things uh, that you would see in tap and jazz. So it wasn't just straight ahead Lindy Hop which I enjoy because I enjoy all different kinds of dance and Al Min's uh, daughter said he also enjoyed all kinds of dance and they're all so related. Um, so I love that and she was such a performer. I mean, just to have her, like whenever she was in town I wanted to see her and even though I might have heard a story of hers, it was always so different because it was alive in her at the time and she'd tell it differently and and she'd come up with these things and I was at an event uh, last year and I heard somebody say uh, are you going to Norma's talk and they said no we've heard Norma before and I'm thinking what how you know you can never feel like that because Norma was so exciting and interesting no matter what she was doing that you just wanted to be I wanted to be around her see her again hear a different story you know have her go off and contradict somebody or yell at somebody or show something a little differently. It was just uh, her passion of her life and uh, I'm going to really miss not seeing her again. Would it be okay with you to come up and say a few words? Because we are approaching the end and I know that you spent a lot of time with her towards the end. So ladies and gentlemen, Miss Adam Broshonski. Good. So, Ada, how was life for Norma towards the end? Um, <clears throat> well, I met, well, I met Norma in the late 90s, so I was about just 13 years old, so I actually got to know her for, I guess, 20 years. Um, the, the last, well, I think the most notable thing about the last maybe five or six years and I forgot to say this earlier today, is for someone, anyone in their 90s, I mean, to go on tour, I don't know if everybody knows this, that she was on tour with the Billy Brothers Band in Italy, um, for someone who's in their 90s to go on tour with the band is just incredible. Um, and to do all of the things that she did in her later years is absolutely astounding. Um, but she was always the same. I mean, she, as I got older, she, Decensored her language with me, <laughs> so she would say things the way she wanted to say them. But um, she was absolutely as vivacious um, from the first moment that I met her until the end. And actually, um, Chris was there, I think, the week before me. And then we, and then I was down in Florida with Chaz and uh, Chaz's daughter Micheline. And um, you know we were listening to tunes and we were talking and dancing with her. This was in Florida, in Florida, at her house. And um, yeah, I mean she just, she just. I remember asking her. We were listening to a Buddy Johnson album, and I asked her um, because I realized that people weren't playing music in the house, and so I, I solved that. I made an instruction manual for the caretakers to to play music, and. Um, and I said, Norma, it feels good, right? She goes, well, I feel something. 
So she, I mean, and that was, you know, towards the end. So she just never lost that uh, fast wit. And Keep swinging, life. right? Yeah, exactly. It reminds me of how Frank he was towards the end also. He never lost the spirit, they just kept it going somehow. And I think that's maybe the responsibility we have now to keep it going somehow, to keep in mind what they has gone to us and just let the spirit continue. Um, we have one more film clip and that will be probably the very last thing we do before we will close this uh, panel discussion because we're gonna dance also and we are running out of time. So this is, once again, this is from the Red, Red Parrot. We are back in 1984, and Chris anxiously wants to say something. Leonard, before we conclude, I just want to again thank the uh, Frankie Manning Foundation, Harlem Swing Dance Society, New York Swing Dance Society, Larry and Sandra Schultz uh, Archive, if I'm missing anyone, all the wonderful people uh, that put this weekend together. Um, Mickey Davidson for such a beautiful service, putting together such a lovely memorial. If I'm missing you, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm very thankful that we can all come together to celebrate the life of someone that we really love and care about, and um, we'll let the film. So we're going to see Dora, and she's going to dance with Billy Ricker, Al Mins, and Frankie Manning.
And thank you very much to all of you. And I give the microphone to Mandy, who probably wants to say a couple of words. Look at all of these patient people who have enjoyed this, but I know are also getting um, sore from sitting or standing at the back. So that was absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm looking for Allison, Barbara, Bronx from the Harlem Swing side. There she is. Okay, so here's what's going to happen. Um, we have a whole bunch of Norma's books, and I want you to be aware that the whole collection here, not that many, but a variety of them. So at 9.30, these will be on sale upstairs. So you can check out this collection of her books. Yeah, so that's going to be great. And there's actually a little performance happening now. They didn't want it on the stage because of these chords, though. So we actually might need to start to just, the, the sound gentleman asked for it to not. Um, okay, I'm going to let you talk to him up there. Um, but So anyways, we're moving on. Check yourselves out. Get ready for a performance any second. And buy a book at 9.30. Thank you. And we're going to have a good time with some dancing and the band coming on. So thank you so much.